In this first lecture, we are going to talk about what biology is, what science is, and how to use a scientific method. So first of all, biology is a study of life. So anything that is considered living is going to be under the category of biology. And on this slide, we have lots of different organisms, um, from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms. All of these are going to be considered life. And we're going to talk about what does it mean to be living, um, what makes, what's the difference between a rock and a fish, you know, what are the, the category or the different aspects that make something living versus non-living. And that's what we're going to really focus on today. So first, a little bit more about biology. Bios, again, means life, and ology means a scientific study of life. And so we will be talking about all different aspects of biology. We'll learn from the very small uh, units um, of atoms and ultimately get to the point where we're talking about molecules and cells um, and organisms and then even higher categories like ecology, which are going to study kind of interactions between organisms and their environments. So now we're going to talk about what are the properties of life. So these, when we say something is living, they have to have these different properties. And so these properties are going to include order, regulation, growth and development, energy processing, response to the environment, reproduction, and evolution. And we're going to break down each of those and give you examples of what those properties are. For example, the first one we're going to talk about is order. So if we look at things that are living, there's lots of organization. And we'll talk about all the different levels of organization later. But these are just three examples of very ordered structure. So we don't have chaos um, happening in the structures of living organisms. Um, so we have a pine cone and two examples of seashells. So these shells are produced by an uh, animal um, that secretes this hard material that makes the shell. And a pine cone is made um, from a tree. And you can see that there's this regular repeating pattern in here. And so you're going to see a lot of order in living organisms. Now, the order is going to be organized from, we can talk about from the very smallest units until the largest units. And so what we're going to kind of see in this image is that we can start at the very smallest level and we'll actually start here when we go into our next um, lecture we're going to start at the atom which is the smallest fundamental unit it's not considered living when it's all by itself but this ultimately is going to be the building block for everything on the planet and in the universe um, when you go from an atom you can then build upon that and create something called a molecule so a molecule is going to be atoms joined together those molecules and then can be combined to form different structures and we get to the level of the cell. So the cell is considered the smallest living unit. So you can have bacteria that are one cell um, and they are considered living. Um, we have trillions of cells in our body um, and each of those cells is going to kind of be able to be broken down. If you have a collection of cells, and they're arranged, they are going to be considered a tissue. We can then have tissues that will have more than one type of cell, which are considered an organ. And then we have something called the organ system. So in, this is all about plants, um, but you can imagine that this works with any other type of living organism. So for tissues, we could have, um, if we're looking at muscles, uh, we could have the muscle cells. And then if a bunch of muscle cells are come together, that's a muscle tissue. Um, we can then have a whole organ, which is interacting parts of the muscle. So it's the muscle plus um, the, the tendons and ligaments that are attaching it to the bone. An organ system can then be all of the muscles in the entire body. And then you ultimately get to a multicellular organism. So that could be a flower in this case, a plant, or it could be a human, um, the whole body. Once we move, move outside of the individual organism, we can then get to something called the population. And a population is going to be individuals of all the same kind. So for example, in this image, we have a population of poppies. We can also have a population of humans. So if we look at the human population and we say it's every single person on the planet because we're all the same species, okay? Once we kind of take a step out of just one 
one group of individuals, we can then get to something called a community, which is all the different species living together. And a species is a category or a type. So we have, for humans, we have one species of human. So every human is gonna be homo sapiens. We are all the same. But when we are then in a community, we could be, if we're living in an area, it could be all the animals that are present in that area. It could be all the plants that are present, all of the bacteria that are present, any type of microorganism. That's the community. We finally get to something called the ecosystem, which is then gonna be the interaction between the community members. So these are all living organisms, but then the environment. So certain things are not considered living. So dirt, water, rocks, all of that is not considered living. And when we see an organism interacting with the environment, we consider this kind of an ecosystem level interaction. And the largest, and we will talk a little bit about this at the very end of the class, um, the biosphere, which is the entire planet. So you're looking at every single thing on the planet um, and you know everything that's on there, every living thing, everything that's not living, um, that would be the biosphere. Here's a different way to visualize the different levels of organization. Um, so in this case, we're mainly looking at kind of from the individual level. So in the previous slide, we talked about kind of down to the atomic level, but we'll get to the individual. So here's one of these fish. And then when we're talking about a population, it's going to include all of the fish of the same kind. So you can see these you know, yellow with black um, fish. And then a community will include all of the, the different living organisms. So we have these bluefish, we have starfish, we have, um, I don't know exactly what these are supposed to be, some type of coral. All of these would be within the community, so all the living organisms. And then when you're looking at an ecosystem, the ecosystem then includes, well, what about the water? What about the carbon dioxide, the oxygen, the dirt, the soil, the sand? All of that is then included in this um, ecosystem. And then you can go to the biome, which is kind of very specific parts of the planet, and then the biosphere, which would be the entire planet. Our next property of life is gonna be regulation. And so regulation has to do with somehow maintaining a internal environment that can be different than your external environment. So we'll initially talk about cells, how cells have membranes, and they're gonna regulate what goes in and out of the cell. But we can also regulate other things like our body temperature. So humans have a really stable body temperature, but if we look at an organism like a lizard, lizards and other reptiles will basically regulate their body temperature um, based on their behavior. So they will go and sit in the sun if they're cold and can warm up, if it gets too hot, they can go back to the shade, but they're regulating their internal environment. So this regulation is really important. Um, and it starts at the cellular level. Growth and development is the next category. So things that are alive will grow and develop. Some things are gonna stay a single celled organism, but they can grow and develop um, regardless. But here we have some different embryos of um, different animals that we have. So fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, human. And this is just showing, this is a very early stage of development when we are an embryo. Um, these are kind of a different type of image. Here we have a kind of a real image of all these embryos. They're all very similar, but what's gonna happen is that they develop over time. And so we start off as um, an egg that has been fertilized with a sperm, but we ultimately will develop into a, uh, a fetus that is gonna have you know, millions of cells. And once we're an adult, we're gonna have trillions of cells. So growth and development is gonna happen in that way. And we'll talk about how growth takes place and how we have development. So how do we start off as an undifferentiated cell? So a cell that is basically, has doesn't have a fate yet to a, a human that has cardiac cells that are for your heart. We have muscle cells, we have neurons. Okay? There has to be some type of development for those cells to become specialized so they can do a specific job. Energy processing is one of the main components of something that is living because you have to be 
intaking energy and to do um, kind of to keep being alive. And so we will talk about energy um, in this semester, specifically about two different processes called photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And both of these processes are kind of converting energy from one form to another so it's usable. When we talk about photosynthesis, we're going to be talking about how we can take solar energy from the sun and turn it into chemical energy that the plant can use for itself. That in turn can then be used by animals. So animals can then take that, consume plant matter, and ingest energy through that mechanism. And so we will be looking at how the energy is transformed um, both in plants and also in animals. Things that are living will respond to the environment. So if you are hot or you are cold, your body is going to respond to the environment and try to either cool your body down or heat your body up depending on what's happening. Um, here we have examples of different types of responses. You may not think that plants respond to the environment, but they actually will. This is a very good example where these are called sensi plants. That's not their official name. But if they touch them, they will actually close up. And this is a protection so that they're not eaten. Um, birds will respond to their environment by migrating. They'll leave one area to go to another. So if it gets really cold and they need to have more food, they'll fly to another area and eat food there. Uh, we have different types of animals that will have actual structures of their body that are able to respond to the environment. So this is a desert hare. It has these huge ears that help radiate heat um, and get rid of it. And our bodies, so we have all of these mechanisms that are um, to protect our bodies. And so we have these reflexes. So if you pick up something that's really hot, your body is going to respond to that. And you basically, your, your reflex is you're going to drop it um, because your body knows, I don't want to, this is going to hurt us. We need to get away from this. Um, and so you will actually drop the pan. Um, and this is a response. So you're responding to your environment. You aren't just kind of sitting there and not responding. Here's another example of a response to the environment. So this is the same exact um, Arctic fox. And the Arctic fox looks like uh, this brownish gray in the summer. And it looks like this white coat in the winter. And it's going to respond to the environment. So it changes its coat so that it blends in to the snow. And then it will lose all of that extra fur. And it will blend in better being this darker color. Okay, and so this is a response, this is actually an anatomical response that's happening with this organism. Reproduction is going to be another aspect of life. So how do we make more living things? Well, it's going to happen through the process of mitosis and meiosis. And those are two topics that we're going to talk about. When we do reproduction, we can either talk about at the cellular level where we're just making new cells and we have one cell that ultimately divides into two cells, but we also are going to talk about how do we make new organisms um, like a new human. So you're going to have to go through the process of meiosis where we have the production of eggs and sperm. Those then will join together and create a new unique human being. And we will talk about those different processes. The last property of life we're going to talk about is evolution. So living things evolve and we will talk throughout the semester about how evolution takes place. Um, we will look at the diversity of life forms that are the result of evolution um, and we'll kind of go through some really important examples um, how evolution takes place. Okay, so this is a important topic in it underlies almost every aspect of biology. So it's very difficult to understand biology without understanding how evolution is working. So I wanted to show these images of these different organisms that are camouflaged and very difficult to see. You probably can see the owls pretty easily. There's three little baby owls, but they, they really are very similar color to the tree. There also is gonna be a snake right here. It's very hard to see. And believe it or not, this is a lizard right here. If you look at these, the reason why I want to point them out is how amazingly camouflaged they are. And 
the only way to understand how they came to be like this is to look at evolution. Okay, and so over generations, many, many generations, there are going to be these processes where certain organisms are going to be able to survive better than others and will leave more offspring. And so that's how you can end up with this bizarrely shaped and colored gecko um, that looks like a leaf. And so we'll talk about how evolution takes place. We'll talk about natural selection and descent with modification. So all these very important terms um, that have to do with evolution. Now, I wanted to mention some major themes that we're going to go over in this class, and these are going to keep on coming up almost every lecture. Um, these themes will be there. And these are going to include the, re the relationship between structure and function, information flow, pathways that transform energy and matter, interactions within biological systems, and evolution. And so I'm going to talk about what each of these um, different unifying themes mean. But just keep them in the back of your mind, and when we go through different parts of the class, I'll point out about this. Um, this relationship of structure and function is very important, and we're going to start there. So when we look at how things are shaped, so think about the body. So we have our body, we have our anatomy, which is kind of the structures within our body, our bones, we have lungs, we have all these different structures. All of those are going to, um, kind of their structure is going to determine how it functions. And so right here, what I have is an example of the lungs. So you have to be breathing to stay alive. And if you look at how the lungs are structured, they, um, you, you know, air is going to enter in through your mouth or your nose, the nasal cavity. It'll go down through the trachea and start to enter into the actual um, lung area. So here would be the trachea. Um, and then once we get into the lungs, we have all of these tiny little branch surfaces um, that we call the alveoli. And so this is an example of what one of the alveoli would look like. So it's a tube. This would have oxygen coming in here. And this alveoli is going to be surrounded by blood vessels. And what's going to happen at this surface is that we are going to have diffusion of oxygen into the bloodstream so that we can then transport it to all of our body. Now, the reason why instead of having just one large alveoli, we have thousands of tiny ones is because you can have move you have a more efficient diffusion of oxygen from kind of inside the lung to the bloodstream over a very short distance and so these alveoli will increase the surface area where we can then pass a lot of air from the lungs into the actual blood okay this also works with co2 where we're trying to get rid of co2 so co2 will be in the blood and we ultimately will breathe it out and we're going to talk about breathing um, when we talk about cellular respiration but it's just important to understand that the structure determines how it functions now the next thing we have is information flow and information flow is going to kind of encompass a lot of different topics um, we have to have information that moves throughout our body so that we can have communication between cells um, we need to be, have communication from our brain to our limbs. So you guys are hopefully writing notes right now. There's information flow from your brain to your hand telling you to write. And in that process, you're also sending back information to your brain about what I'm talking about right now. So there's lots of information that's transmitted and received within the body. And we'll talk about some of those different mechanisms. But there also is going to be information flow of kind of... A set of blueprints or directions for everything that has to happen in your body so we are going to call these genes so we have the DNA and the DNA is going to have instructions on every single aspect of your life okay so you know what color is your hair what color is your eyes how you know all these different proteins and enzymes that you have to make that is information flow and we will talk about how information flows from one generation to the next so we'll talk about how when you make sperm and egg, you are putting your information into that sperm or egg, and that is then going to connect and join with another, depending on what it is, sperm or egg, and create a new unique human that has a unique set of directions. 
Okay, and so we'll talk a lot about DNA and how it's actually able to have information flow. So pathways that transform energy and matter are going to be um, very important for this class. They are sometimes considered the more difficult topics, but we're going to slow it down and make sure that we get through it when we get to that um, part of the class. But it's important to just understand this process of, you know, we have to have energy flow coming in. We are also going to um, need to break down different um, chemicals so that we can extract them from food. There is going to be kind of you can think of how the different matter, and we'll talk about what matter is, but it's kind of the, the actual materials of life, how that is going to be transformed. And um, we can talk about how nutrients cycle through the system. You know, think about how water moves through the ecosystem where it can start in the ocean or in a lake. It can be evaporated or it can be ingested. Um, if it's ingested, you drink some water, you eventually will pee it out. It goes back into the system and then we have this recycling. So we'll talk a lot about how energy is kind of first brought to the planet through the sun um, and then converted into a usable form of energy because we cannot go outside and just absorb sunlight and expect to um, have enough energy. We actually have to eat our energy. Um, and so we'll talk about how photosynthesis allows for that conversion and then we can eat um, plants and organisms that eat plants um, to get our energy. Now there's going to be lots of interactions. We've already talked about this um, before about these different biological uh, levels of organization. Um, one of the key points I want to point out on this slide is that when we go down to the, the very small level of the atoms in the molecules, so the atoms and molecules are not alive. Okay, on their own, they are not living. But the way that they will combine will have something called an emergent property. Okay, so when we start to combine carbon and oxygen and hydrogens, um, when those come together, they will then create something that is life. And we will talk about how that happens. Okay, so you can, it's kind of like you can break everything down to its very small units. The small units are not living, but when you put them together, this new property comes about. And in this case, the main property is going to be life. Okay. We'll talk about kind of where atoms come from um, and kind of how they join together. Okay. So emergent property basically means an organism is a living whole greater than the sum of its parts. So if you broke it apart, it is going to be more than... Um, or those parts won't be living, but if you combine them together, they can have make something that is living. The last thing is going to be evolution. Um, like I mentioned before, this is very, very important. Now, the big thing about evolution is that it unifies all of life. So we will talk about how we think um, life began on Earth. It's going to go back um, over three billion years ago and we'll talk about how that process takes place and how well, how we hypothesize it takes place because no one living was there at that time but what we're going to see is that all living organisms are related to each other okay obviously there's gonna be some things that we're more related to closely but if you go back there is a common ancestor to all living things and we'll talk about the different aspects of um, of these living things that tell us that um, all of all organisms have DNA all of them have the same proteins or same amino acids um, and so we'll talk about kind of that diversity of life and how we know everything is related okay um, this also we can look at similarities among living things and fossils um, that can show that there's relationships and but things change over time um, and all living things have similar cellular processes. They have to convert energy um, into a usable form. And so, you know, we'll be seeing all these different things in the class. Uh, and like I said, DNA is the kind of universal chemical structure. So you don't have anything that we consider living on the planet that doesn't have DNA. Okay, so why do all living organisms have DNA? Um, we will talk about that. We will also talk about evolution and Charles Darwin, who kind of first promoted this idea. Um, 
the process of evolution is how all of the diversity on life came about. Um, it is based on heritable changes that are um, encoded within the DNA, and we'll talk about those heritable changes and how that takes place. Um, the process that we'll go into depth about is called natural selection, and so there are certain traits that make organisms survive and have more offspring that will then um, kind of become more uh, prevalent in the next generation. Okay, and so when we get to the evolution lectures, we'll talk about this in depth. Okay, and I already mentioned this, but evolution explains why all of the life forms um, kind of have these similarities in them. From So you have the same DNA that bacteria does. Um, so how is that? It's all because we have a common ancestor. So we're now going to move on to what is science and kind of how is science performed because it has a very specific um, process of science. And this is really important because if science didn't have kind of these regular or regulated processes, you wouldn't be able to trust what people say when, they, when it comes to lots of scientific things. And we're going to talk about that you need to question what you are taught, what you read, what you hear, because a lot of people try to say that something has scientific evidence proves this, but you have to really look at it and examine it and see, well, let me, what did, did they actually go through the steps of the scientific method? Is this something that's widely accepted? We'll talk about how that is going to um, kind of take place. Now, if we think about how humans described their environment or the world around them prior to kind of what we would call science, uh, there are lots of different things that humans use and they continue to use these today to understand the world around them. And so some of these things include religion, myth, magic, ethics, philosophy, art, and music. And so it's not, I'm not going to say like don't um, look to these different types of ways of seeing the world. I'm just going to say that there are, we're going to talk about what science is and what it's not. Okay, and so um, lots of people will use multiple things off of this list um, to try to understand what's happening around them. But when we start to talk about science, science is going to mean something very specific. And in order for something to be scientific, it's going to have to follow some guidelines. So what is science? So science means to know, and it's going to be a tool for us to look at and understand our world. Okay. Uh, it will help us understand our universe from kind of the smallest particles, which we call atoms, to the vastness of space. And so trying to understand kind of, you know, these very diverse um, arenas. And it helps us to describe the different patterns that we see um, in our everyday lives. And, you know, this is going to encompass a lot more than just biology. So... You know, when we start off, we're going to talk a lot about chemistry. So what are the materials of, of the universe? Uh, then you can have physics or kind of like how, how are they working? What are the rules of the universe? And when we have um, kind of those things come together, we can then have this emergent property of life. Okay, so when we have both the rules of the universe, which I would call physics, um, and we also have chemistry, the materials. When those things come together, we have something called biology. Um, and so science will encompass a lot different, a lot of different types, but uh, we will focus on biology. So science is not going to be the following things. It is not a value system, so it should not be something that you, you know, is telling you this is good, this is bad. Um, it is not a religion. Okay. It has to be um, kind of unbiased. So when we do science, we can't filter our observations. And what this means is if I have some belief um, in mind about some pattern that I'm seeing, and then I do an experiment and I get an answer and it doesn't fit in with my previous beliefs, you know, I can't filter my observations. I can't say, well, I don't think that's happening, but even though my results say it is. So you have to make sure that you're trying to be objective when you're doing science. Um, when we have kind of contradictions between our values, morals, ethics, religious beliefs, 
um, we still need to be objective. And so we will talk about evolution in this class a lot, and um, evolution is a theory that we'll talk about. It's important to know that you can definitely be very religious and believe in evolution um, and kind of understand what that means. Uh, you do not, they're not mutually exclusive in my mind because they don't answer the same questions. Okay, so they're very different. Um, and I know that that's hard for some people to understand and it's something you have to really think about, but they really are not answering the same question. So, you know, when we're in here, we're going to talk about science, we're going to talk about the evidence that we find, experiments, um, but that does not need to contradict your beliefs. So there are lots of different types of questions that we can have about our, our, our universe, our surroundings, and some of those questions are going to be able to be answered by science, but others aren't, okay? And so we'll turn to other kind of avenues to answer some of those questions. So philosophy is one of them. So what is the meaning of life? There is no way to test the meaning of life scientifically because it can mean something completely different to every person. Um, so there is no right or wrong answer. Um, is there a God? We can't answer that with science. Okay, that we do not have the technology or the know-how to even ask that question. So that would be something that you would turn to religion and faith um, to, to answer. So for these types of questions, you want to turn to religion, philosophy, the arts, anything that is going to help you with that type of question. Okay, but you can't turn to science for these. And so I said this before, but there really should not be a conflict between questions asked by science and religion because they deal with different aspects of life. So, you know, you have to have some other type of mechanism of answering questions other than science when you're asking something like, is there a God? What happens after you die? All those types of questions. And so we cannot turn to science um, when we ask those questions. Okay. So one of the main things I want you to take out of this entire class at the very, you know, what are you going to be using 20 years from now is how to implement the scientific method. And the truth is you've probably already been doing this every single day of your life, but you just haven't thought about it in this way. So the scientific method is going to be the way that we actually conduct science. Okay. And it's going to be a process of steps that allows us to Kind of try to understand what is happening in our physical surroundings and it's going to allow us to come to some conclusions um, but it's going to be one of these things where it's it constantly can change so I know something that's made um, people really frustrated during this entire COVID-19 time where you're hearing different um, information about kind of face masks or this or that and I know it's really frustrating when people say, well, you're not, you shouldn't, you don't need to wear a face mask now. Then they say, oh, well, no, you do need to wear a face mask. But that is how science works. We take the information that we have and we can make some conclusion based on that. But if we get new information, we have to change what we say. Okay, so initially they didn't understand um, about face masks that they were protecting against um, kind of, the aerosol of the virus. But now we know that face masks are actually very efficient if you have really, you know, a good one at reducing the spread of COVID-19, specifically if you are a carrier and if you're not, you still want to wear one because it's going to help protect you. But the reason why we have these statements that are coming out from scientists that we, you know, want to trust, why they change is because if you get new information in, you have to change what's happening. So this is why it's called an ongoing dialogue because it's not going to ever be set in stone. If we get new information that says, you know what, face masks work, then we need to tell people to wear face masks. If we find out that, um, you know, something else new about it, well, maybe it doesn't, you can't catch it if it's on a piece of food, um, then we will kind of make sure that everyone knows that. But if they find out that, well, no, actually, the virus can live on the food and you can get infected that way, then we would have to say that. That is actually not something that's happened. They, the more the information has come out, they do not think you can catch it from food. It has to be um, breathed in. So, But I'm just saying that you have to have this ongoing dialogue and things do change. And while it's frustrating, it is something that 
we want science to be able to do because if science was set in stone and what we say is what we say and it can't change, that's not going to reflect really what's going on. So we're going to talk about the, diff the different steps of um, kind of the process of science. And we're specifically going to look at testing and experiments. So one of the main important topics of you know, the first um, lecture and lab is this idea of this hypothesis. So a hypothesis is a proposed explanation for a set of observations. A hypothesis can be considered sort of an educated guess. Um, where you have some type of observation, you've seen something, and then you guess um, kind of based on some, you know, anything that's already been known about this topic, you make a kind of an educated guess about what you think is actually happening. Okay. In order for a hypothesis to be considered a hypothesis, it has to be testable and it has to be falsifiable. These two terms right here are absolutely essential for you to know. Okay, testable means that someone can go test your hypothesis. Okay, so um, there have been lots of studies about, about face masks and face masks have been kind of a controversial topic, topic and they're saying some people say they don't help and they're actually dangerous for you. Well, there have been lots of scientific ex experiments done on this and they've been tested. So they've done one of these experiments where they actually will look at all of the particles that come out of your mouth when you're breathing um, and your nose. And they're able to use these cameras that will pick up all of those and they can see the amount of particles that can get through um, with different types of face masks. Okay, and that would be testable. So you could take a test and see that. Um, it also has to be falsifiable. So there has to be the possibility of proving it incorrect. So you, there are certain questions that are not, you can't test them. It's just like there's no way to test it. And uh, that means that we couldn't prove it false which means that it's not falsifiable. So in order for a hypothesis to be a scientific hypothesis, it has to potentially be wrong and it, you have to be able to test it and show that it is wrong. If it's something that you can, can't prove, um, doesn't happen, uh, it's very, you just can't test it. And I'll give you more examples of that in, when you get into lab. Okay, now when we get into hypotheses, uh, some of them are going to easily be made into experiments or scientific tests where you can set up these different variables and conditions under which you're testing uh, your uh, your hypothesis okay some other ones you can have a valid hypothesis but you can't really um, test it in an experiment you have to do more observations um, some of these are kind of ecological issues where you're trying to understand how an organism in their environment are behaving. Um, you can't really take them out of that environment, but sometimes it's very difficult to actually um, control everything about uh, an experiment. So um, there are going to be different types of experiments that we'll have. Okay. And at the end of an experiment or the second case when you have these observations, you either are going to support or not support your hypothesis. Okay, so there are times when you're going to come to be like, well, we can't really tell if what we're seeing is what um, the, says our hypothesis is correct, or we can't say that it's um, not correct. And so you might have to retest again. But you either have, you're going to say, I can support it at this time, or I can't support it because I don't have enough information. So here is the setup of the scientific method. And the scientific method, like I mentioned, is going to be a series of steps that we will go through. The first step is going to be that you have an observation. And instead of giving you a very scientific observation, let's do something that you have happened, probably um, each of you have probably had, had happen at some point. So you are watching TV um, or you're trying to watch TV, you get your remote and the TV will not turn on. Okay, and so you, that's an observation. So I press the remote, the on button, it's not turning on, okay? You then have a question. You say, why is my TV not turning on? You can then have a hypothesis where the hypothesis is going to be, I think it needs new batteries. And then you can actually test that. So if we say we think that 
we need to put new batteries in there. Our prediction is if we put new batteries in and the batteries were dead before, it should turn on. Okay, and so we can actually test that. And if at the end of that, we put new batteries in and it turns the TV on, we then have proved that our hypothesis was correct. Now, you may have also had the situation where that didn't work. So you put in batteries, it didn't turn on. And so you have to go back to your hypothesis. So I put in new batteries, um, the batteries are not the problem. Well, maybe it's not, the TV is not plugged in. So you would have to go through a whole series of testing. This is something that you do all the time. Okay, so something's not working. You're like, why is this not working? I bet it's this. Let me try this out. If it doesn't work, I'm going to try something else. Okay, so this is what the scientific method is. And you probably use this constantly. Okay, but you wouldn't call it necessarily the scientific method um, when you're doing it. Okay, but this is going to be extremely important. And most of what we talk about in this class are going to we arrive at these conclusions about biology based on people doing experiments and going through all of these steps. So I'm going to give you a real example of something that has had the scientific method used in order to determine um, kind of how humans are affected by smoking cigarettes. Okay, and so if you buy cigarettes uh, these days, you will have a Surgeon General's warning, which means that as the, the United States of America has determined through the different scientific agencies that smoking can cause the following, can cause lung cancer, heart disease, emphysema, and may complicate a pregnancy. So the reason that that can be on a packet, and obviously that is not something that the sellers want to put on there, because it's telling you basically you have the possibility of getting cancer on uh, if you ingest this, but they have to put it on there because they have to warn the people that are going to be consuming these uh, cigarettes that you know there is a possibility that you are going to get cancer, and they're once you are kind of buying that, you are taking the liability of getting cancer on your own. So you cannot sue the tobacco company because you don't have to buy it. They're warning you, but you're still doing it. Now, I want to talk about how we got to this point, because there was a time where people um, that went to the doctor would actually get um, sub or not subscribed, but prescribed cigarettes. So if you were anxious they would, or had some lung problems, they would say, well, if you smoke, you'll breathe really deeply and it'll kind of calm you down. This is completely bizarre if we think about it today because we know it causes all these problems. And for a doctor to be saying you should smoke um, as medical advice seems bizarre. Um, so here are some ads from the early 1900s that are going to show you um, physicians say luckies are less irritating it's toasted so they're these are doctors that are saying if you're going to smoke you should smoke luckies they don't they're going to throw uh, your throat protection against irritation against cough okay so these are doctors that are promoting and are probably being paid to promote so this is kind of like instagram in the back in the days where people have to say ad um, so they're promoting these different cigarettes and saying that, you know, if there's a doctor on there, then it must be healthy because doctors are well educated. They know about human health. So I should definitely listen to my doctor. We now know that this is not what you should be doing. And the doctors were actually causing more issues for their patients. And so I wanted to bring up some important dates. So in 1966, the Surgeon General was able to say for the first time that smoking cigarettes was ha may be hazardous. So it's not saying it's hazardous, but it may be. So during this time, what's happening is that lots and lots of individuals were getting lung cancer and at a much higher rate than you would expect. And when they looked at those individuals, the common denominator was that all of them were smoking cigarettes. And so we, we start to see that there may be some connection between smoking and, cigar, um, and lung cancer. So they started to do experiments. Uh, they would look at kind of patients. They wouldn't give humans, you know, like this group gets to smoke cigarettes, this group doesn't. You can't experiment on humans like that. 
but they would give tobacco to rodents and other lab animals and see if they were um, gonna get more cancer um, than those that weren't exposed to tobacco. By the time we hit 1970, lots of different experiments have been done and they can now say that smoking is dangerous. And then in 1985, they were able to then give a list of the actual increased risk of these different diseases that you can get if you smoke. So lung cancer, heart disease, emphysema, and may complicate pregnancy. So these different things are now put on the cigarette packet saying, this is a warning. You should know that when you ingest these, you are increasing your chances of all of these different diseases. Okay, but the only way that we can get to that point is through lots of testing and using the scientific method. Okay, so that's just a real example of how it was used. So I wanna explain how you would do an experiment like the ones that would kind of show us that smoking cigarettes can lead to lung cancer and these other diseases. So I'm gonna come up with a different example, but we will go through the steps of how that experiment would go and kind of talk about the different aspects of the experiment. So first of all, when we would do an experiment like this, it would be considered a controlled experiment. And this is when we're gonna have two or more groups that are gonna differ in one variable. And I'll talk what a variable is in a second. And we're gonna design a test to look at that one variable, okay? So for example, if we are talking about kind of the, a, a new drug that is supposed to help lower blood pressure, okay? And we want to test this in mice first. We're going to do it in mice because we don't want to go straight to humans because if it's dangerous, we don't want to do anything um, to the humans. So we're going to have two groups of mice and we're going to have a variable that we are going to vary between those two groups. One group is going to be given the actual drug for blood pressure medicine and the second group is not going to be exposed to that drug. Okay, and I'll explain what we're going to do to that group. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to give one group the variable and the other group is not going to be exposed to it. Okay, so the variable is going to be the factor that changes in the experiment. So in this case, we're going to have the blood pressure medication that we were going to expose to one group and the other group is not going to be exposed to it. We will then see how does that affect the blood pressure of the two groups. So one group, we are not giving them anything and what we consider that group is the control group. They're going to not receive the specific, in this case, medicine, okay? The other group is going to be considered the experimental group where they are gonna receive, in this case, the blood pressure medicine. And so what we wanna do is we wanna expose these two groups to their different variables. So one group's getting the blood pressure medicine, the other group is not and we're going to then test their blood pressure. So in this case, we'll say that the blood pressure medicine is supposed to lower the blood pressure. And so we will measure the blood pressure of these two groups. We do not expect the control group to change because they are not receiving the blood pressure medication, okay? What that control group is going to get is they are going to get something called a placebo. It is going to be a it's gonna smell and taste and look exactly like the medication that the other group is gonna get, but it does not have the active ingredient that is going to um, cause the, the blood pressure to lower, okay? It's important that each of the groups are exposed to similar situations and kind of the similar steps so that we know that what we're looking at is just that variable, okay? So is that blood pressure medication actually working? So again, we expect the control group not to change because we're not really giving them anything. And we expect the experimental group to potentially have lower um, blood pressure. Okay, so when we do control experiments like this and when we do it in humans, it's really important to have that placebo because you want to make sure that the one group is receiving something. Um, if we are actually dealing with humans, then if you have two groups that are, let's just say we got to the point where we could test the mice and the, the medication looks like it does lower blood pressure, so then we end up getting 
a, a bunch of humans and we're going to test this. And so we assign the humans into two groups. One group is going to get the blood pressure medicine and the other group is going to get a placebo, which ends up actually being just like a sugar pill. We have to give the humans something, otherwise they'll know that they don't get the medication. So what we do is we set up this thing called a single blind experiment or a double blind experiment where the individuals that are in the two groups, they do not know what they're getting. And we often want the people who are the ones that are going to look at the blood pressure measure. We also do not want them to know what these individuals, what group they're in. This is really important because if you are a scientist that's trying to get a new medication for blood pressure to kind of hit the market, you may be inclined to see a change in blood pressure when it may not actually be there. Okay, and so in that situation where both the individuals receiving the medication and the people that are doing the observations do not know who has what, so they don't know if they're getting a, uh, the blood pressure medication or the placebo, that is considered a double blind experiment. Okay, so neither of the subjects know what they're getting and the researchers also don't know. Okay, these are the best kind of experiments to do with humans because it's really important to reduce as much biases and um, kind of conflict as possible. And so if you don't know what that individual has, you will not be able to kind of sway the results one way or the other. Okay, the placebo, again, is going to be usually in humans a sugar pill. You probably have heard of this idea of the placebo effect. And so people can actually convince themselves that they are getting better um, with a placebo. And it's kind of the psychological process that happens, which is another reason why we don't really want them to know what they're getting or not. Because it's possible if we see that a bunch of people on the sugar pill all of a sudden are having lower blood pressure, we're going to be really confused because there's no reason why the blood pressure could go down. But it's possible that they have this placebo effect, which is making them think that they're actually receiving medication. Okay, um, and so this is just a little more ex explanation about that double blind experiment. Now, once a hypothesis has been tested many times, we can then kind of move on and start to call it something else, um, specifically the term theory. So a theory is going to be a comprehensive and well substantiated explanation. So it's a hypothesis that has been tested countless times and has kind of proven to be correct in all of those times. Now, a theory can change if there is new um, kind of data that comes in that does not kind of support the hypothesis. But the theories that we will talk about are things that have been tested countless times that have always kind of held up to um, those experiments. Okay, uh, theories are often what we are widely accepted by scientists, and uh, they will only kind of hold those those as theories until they've had a large, varied, and growing body of evidence. Okay, so you have to continuously test these things um, and try to kind of look at this um, from different ways. They are also, um, you can use the word theory to explain observations um, and then to devise new and testable hypotheses, but in general, when we say theory um, in this class, we're kind of talking about these topics that have been and well tested. So the theory of evolution, the theory of gravity, things like that. Um, and again, as any theory or hypothesis with a scientific, you know, in the scientific realm, if something new comes in, so contradictory evidence, you have to change your theory. You cannot stay stuck in that hypothesis or in that theory if it does not hold up to um, continued experiments.
The theory that we're going to talk about the most in this class is the theory of evolution. And because we call it the theory of evolution, we're saying that this is a theory that has been tested countless times and has always stood up um, to the evidence. Okay, and so you have to test your ideas. People are continuously testing evolution and looking at how evolution takes place. Um, but some of the different kind of predictions that have to um, be tested are kind of looking at similarities and differences of modern living organisms. So if evolution is taking place, you should see that there are similarities between um, fossils and kind of organisms that are alive today. Um, but there also can be differences and explain those differences through the process of evolution. Uh, one thing that we can do is look at the distribution of extinct fossils in organisms. So organisms that have gone extinct, um, we can understand kind of where they are in the history of the world and try to understand kind of what came after them, what came before them. And you can see kind of these different steps um, in their evolution. So I'm going to show you an example of that right now. So here we have an example of kind of using the fossil record as evidence for evolution. So if we look at kind of our modern day whales, uh, we can actually tra trace back the evolutionary steps and ancestors that led to these groups. Now, the interesting thing about whales is that these mammal, they're mammals, um, they are secondarily aquatic, which means that they did not evolve to be aquatic um, kind of initially. So we had animals that they um, evolved in the water, and then we had some animals that left the water and became terrestrial, so they lived on land. And then some of those animals eventually went back and lived in the water. And what we can see is on this slide, we have kind of, this looks almost like a tiger or some type of dog. It's, it's not really like that, but kind of an interesting looking animal. And what you can see in the fossil record is that these different fossils, and you can kind of see the different steps um, that evolution took place in, and ultimately ending up with these groups that are kind of modern day um, whales, okay? Uh, so you can see these fossils in the fossil record. You also can see that based on this evolutionary um, history, whales used to have um, arms and legs, okay? And what can happen is sometimes there's some weird things that happen during development and legs will show up on these whales. They're not supposed to be there. We'll explain kind of how um, this happens later on, but this is called a vestigial organ. And it's basically an organ that should have disappeared at some point, uh, but for some reason there was a developmental issue and it kind of appeared. Okay? And so this is kind of showing an ancestral view into its ancestry where at one time, there were going to be um, kind of back legs on these organisms. So I just want to stress again this idea that only certain types of questions can be tested. And in order for us to have a scientific hypothesis, there has to be some means of actually testing that and then doing the test again that has re reproducible results. If you do an experiment that no one else will ever be able to reproduce, that can't really be considered evidence of that hypothesis. So there's lots of times where different individuals will do similar experiments to try to see if they receive the same results. And it's really important. So when you do a test to, um, or experiment to test a drug, for example, that somehow is going to help with a certain disease, you don't test it once because it may work for people, but you don't know if that's actually just a fluke or if that's what is going to happen. And so you have to do multiple tests to make sure that the results that you see are actually what's happening. One of the most important skills that I want you to take from this class is to be able to look at information that is given to you, that you read, that you see, that you hear, and being able to determine if what you're receiving is something that you can trust, if it's a uh, valid source, is it something that has been tested? And 
in this case, I'm talking mainly about scientific information. Um, and I want to talk about this, this difference between science and pseudoscience. The word pseudo or the kind of prefix pseudo means fake or false. And there are lots of things that we see and hear um, on social media that are kind of labeled as scientific, but I would consider them pseudoscience. And, you know, the majority of scientists would consider them pseudoscience. Because if someone is making a claim about some thing and it doesn't have kind of the rigorous testing that science um, it requires, then you can't consider it um, actual science. So let's talk a little bit about what this means. So let's talk about scientific claims. And there are lots of things that are going to be put out there on Instagram, on YouTube, kind of saying that this is scientifically proven to help you lose weight or help you get over your depression, help you do this or help you do that. And it's really important for you to evaluate those claims and see if they are actually valid. Now, let's give a definition of pseudoscience. So pseudoscience is a field of study that is falsely presented as having a scientific basis. So it's saying something like, it's been proven that, um, for example, if we look at this slide um, for this Facebook page, smoky quartz jet and lapis azul will help overcome depression. Okay, and so if you wear this continuously and hold it at either the solar plexus or the heart chakras, this will help you. Um, we also have something about essential oils, ylang ylang and chamomile, and these are kind of statements that you could overcome depression. Well, I, I'm not saying anything about whether to use crystals or not, or whether there's any um, benefits of essential oils. There definitely can be, and it can make you feel very good, and if it works for you, that is great. I'm very happy that that can help you out. But you have to make sure that people aren't trying to tell you something that has scientific basis. So what we would have to look at are, well, where's the proof that this is gonna help someone overcome depression? A lot of times when we have kind of these types of statements, they are going to um, kind of use anecdotal evidence, which means that it worked for someone else. And I'm gonna be honest, it probably did work for someone, okay? And it helped them feel better. And that is where they're saying this will help you overcome depression. But if you look at, you know, look for the information and the literature about crystals and depression, you're not gonna find anything, okay? There haven't been scientific studies that have used the scientific method in kind of a large way to prove that kind of holding these different types of crystals are going to help you overcome depression, okay? Um, so it's important to kind of recognize what pseudoscience is. And a lot of times, unfortunately, people are trying to sell you things and, uh, they want you to believe what they're saying, and so they'll make it sound very convincing and will kind of give you all of these anecdotal evidence, and they'll even kind of point to specific scientific studies sometimes. But you have to go to those original sources of that science and see, well, what is it actually telling me? Because sometimes they can twist what they're, they're showing you. So one thing i just wanted to mention because i do know that a lot of people like to have kind of the, they have the energy um, with these crystals and all these different things and i think it's very fascinating and i think it's a very old um and it's been around for a long time this kind of energy within these different types of gems and stones and there for a lot of people it makes them feel better it makes them feel comfortable and that is completely valid Okay, um, there are lots of people that will use essential oils that will help them calm down or take away their headache. That is completely valid, but you cannot say with scientific um, background or scientific experiment that any of those have been tested in the rigorous way that we need for a scientific claim. Okay, so you would have to do lots of experiments with the crystals and the different essential oils in order to prove that. Um, no one's doing that. 
because there's not really a need for it. Um, but I just wanted to, again, um, put it out there about these different um, claims. So when we're looking at science versus pseudoscience, there's here is a list of kind of what you would see in science versus pseudoscience. The main difference of these two things is in science, you're going to use the scientific method. You're going to have results that are repeatable. So someone else can do your experiment and get the same result. You're going to have a testable hypothesis that possibly can be disproven. Okay, you have to have something, remember I talked about hypotheses, they have to be testable and falsifiable. So that means that they possibly are wrong. Um, you have to be open to outside review and there needs to be multiple lines of evidence. When we have pseudoscience, generally uh, pseudoscience does not use the process of science, so you would not use all the steps of the scientific method. The results often can't be duplicated, so no one else can do the same experiment and have the same result or they rely on a single person or on just opinion, okay? Uh, they often will have unprovable or untestable claims. And if you can't test it right there, we know that it can't be science. They often will reject external review or refusal to accept contradictory evidence. So oftentimes in pseudoscience, if you get a contradictory result, they will just brush it off and say, well, that's not important, okay? And they usually re, um, rely on a small amount of data and they're not really looking at the underlying causes um, that they should be, okay? So for example, um, we have an image of this pyramid that is supposed to um, kind of channel energy into the body, but we know through countless different lines of evidence that the only way to for a human to ingest or kind of get energy is to break down food that we eat. Okay, and then we'll, we'll talk about cellular respiration and that whole process. So here is a source reliability checklist. So the next time that someone, you or you encounter some type of claim that's saying, well, this is scientifically proven that this happens. I would like you to try to go through these different checklists and see if what you're reading is something that you should trust. Okay, so is it current or is this a uh, claim from 1999? It may still be fine, but if it's really old, we may know new stuff about this topic. Is it a primary source and not a secondary source? So for example, a lot of times we'll read articles from different magazines and or news blogs, and that will be about a, a scientific study but itself, the article in the magazine or on the news blog is not the, the primary source, it's a secondary source. So whenever they give you the option, go to that primary source and look at the scientific article where it has the actual information from the study. Because a lot of times what happens is people can misinterpret what a scientific study kind of found and twist it in a way that will help them sell something or kind of promote some idea. Make sure that the authors are identifiable and well qualified. So people that are doing um, different type of scientific studies are often going to have graduate degrees, but there also are going to people that know a lot about some topic. They don't necessarily have to have, you know, a PhD or a master's. They could be just really well versed in subtype of topic. And so you'd look at, are they qualified? Have they been doing what they've been doing for the last 30 years, okay? Um, and also, is it a real person or a made up doctor that they're using, okay? Make sure that there are no um, conflicts of interest. So if an author works for the sugar company and they're trying to say that sugar isn't bad for you, I would be concerned, okay? Because it's clearly in the interest of the author to promote sugar consumption. Um, you know, are the references cited? Okay, so if they say scientifically proven, where is the science? You need to be able to see the science, okay? And if they're talking about experiments, does it have enough detail? Could it be reproduced? Was it peer reviewed? Is it unbiased? And, you know, what is the intent of the source? Is it known and valid? Okay, so are they trying to just give you information? Are they trying to sell you something? It's really important to keep all of those things in mind. So here is an example 
that I thought was really interesting about pseudo um, kind of has to do with pseudoscience. And it's this person that um, I think is well known in certain circles. His name is Anthony William, and he has written multiple books that he tries to sell. And this one is called Cell Reduce, the most powerful medicine of our time, healing millions worldwide. Okay, so that is a science, that's a claim. He's claiming that this is cell reduce is healing millions worldwide, okay? So I would first wanna know where's the evidence of that? What is What are they being cure, cured of, okay? What is it about the cell reduce that's curing them? Well, it turns out that if you look into Mr. William, he's not a doctor, he has not gone to medical school, um, and he considers himself a medical medium, which is a person that um, is not trained as a medical doctor or trained in nutrition. And he actually states um, how he considers himself a medical medium. He says, the spirit starts to speak to me and I write every word exactly the way spirit wants it until I have a stack of notepads many feet high. So it was a gift given to him. And this person was actually on Keeping Up with the Kardashians and I think tried to help Kim Kardashian with her psoriasis. And I have saw Cell Reduce kind of explode um, on social media with different you know, fashion bloggers and all these different people. But the truth is, celery is basically water. It does have some um, other things inside of it, but they are no different from what you would get from other vegetables. Um, the, people have actually done experiments with the cell reduce, and there is no proof that it is going to kind of heal you of all these different ailments. It may make you feel better. It probably is making you feel better because you're more hydrated, but it's really important for people to know kind of, well, should we trust this Mr. William? What is his intent? Is he trying to sell you something? Um, and in this case, I would say he is trying to make money off of these books. Okay, and so this would be a perfect example of what I would call pseudoscience. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you wanna watch out for in the future. So that's gonna end today's lecture.